So when I was a nerdy little kid, like really little, like in the 90s, my family didn't have cable because my parents were super old and they remembered back in the day when there were only like three stations to choose from. So they were like, this is fine. Basically the only shows I got to watch then were on PBS Kids. Then we got cable and then I started watching too much like SpongeBob or whatever. But I remember sitting in the like living room watching TV and my dad comes in and he's in the doorway and he's pointing at the TV like, you need to watch more PBS. So I turn on the television and what comes on is this show, nay, this experience called Liberty's Kids. Liberty's Kids was a PBS kids show that ran from 2002 to 2003 about the American Revolution and I was obsessed with it. It was the beginning of me writing uh, like self-insert fan fiction in my head, which then evolved into me uh, just like coming up with my own ideas and culminated in me spending too much money to study screenwriting. I'm in so much debt. I've always known like way too much about the American Revolution because I grew up on the East Coast, especially in Massachusetts. Uh, there was that American Girl doll, Felicity. She was one of my favorite. Then like a few years ago, Alexander Hamilton was sexy again. What a time to be alive. And then I was reminded of how fascinating some of the people were. And then I was working on a script about one of the people. And to prepare for that, I've been watching a lot more Liberty's Kids. And boy, is it a weird show. As you probably can tell from me saying that I spent a lot of money and I'm in debt uh, film, I didn't study history. So, so I'm not like a total expert on this, but I, I like to be informed. So I'm gonna watch this show and have fun with it, but also talk a little bit about like the history and the historical claims that are kind of being made. But I have some sources that I'll share below. And I got a five on the AP US history test in a year where not a lot of people did in 2011. So kind of am an expert really. The whole show is on YouTube. Let's watch it. Do you recognize that singing voice? Cause that's Aaron Carter, who apparently has been having like some drama with his brother or something. I don't know, but that's a throwback. Feeling the pain as innocence dies. <laughs> Also, spoiler alert, on the lyrics, searching for a hero to idolize, I'm pretty sure that's Benedict Arnold they're showing. So that's really funny. Okay, Aaron. Bars. They do this on today's episode, uh, but the future episodes never do a last time, which I don't remember five minutes ago. I'm gonna need a reminder, especially when I'm eight. Dearest mother, I can hardly believe it's been a fortnight since I bade you all farewell. Okay, so this is Sarah. She's from England, but she's coming to stay with Ben Franklin and his friends in the colonies. She's waiting for her dad to get out of the wilderness. Uh, and she talks about his locket. That'll be important later. Kinda, not really. This blonde kid is James. He's an apprentice at Ben Franklin's newspaper. And the dude who's basically running things is Moses. He's a freed former slave. We'll get, we'll talk about that. Then Henri, who's this little French kid, comes in with a letter from Ben Franklin. Turns out Sarah isn't coming to Philly. She's going to Boston. Boston? That's in Massachusetts Bay Colony. As you know. So they, they just find out they have to go to Boston from Philly. 250 years ago and they're just like yeah okay sure like it's nothing like aren't they gonna have to take like a horse or something how long did that take like even today going from philly to boston like that's annoying enough that takes like five or six hours and like i've been on the mass pike before i don't want to do that this is such an inconvenience and they're just like Okay. We get our first glimpse of Ben Franklin. He's played by the late legendary news dude, Walter Cronkite. He's talking to Sarah's mom, so I guess they're close. Which, knowing what a perv Ben Franklin was, um, and considering that Sarah's dad is gone in the wilderness, uh, I think they're having an affair. Danger in Philadelphia? <laughs> Let me put your mind at ease. It's a fine city. 
So we cut to this dive bar. You know me as Sam Adams. Okay, so there's two genres that do this as you, why do I keep, do, I'm doing so many finger quotes, my finger hurts. There's two genres that basically do this as you know thing a lot. Uh, historical stuff, like the crown is really big on it, and kid stuff. And this is both. He's basically explaining stuff the audience would already know, like the stuff Parliament was doing. He even has that painting of the Boston Massacre, which I think Sam Adams actually had commissioned, so that's a nice touch. Governor Hutchinson insists on collecting Parliament's tea tax! But did we have a vote? No! Meanwhile, the majority of people actually in England didn't have a vote either. Actually, okay, so let's talk about some of the motivations for the Boston Tea Party. So the British had taxed the tea, like, years before that. But only the British tea was taxed, and therefore more expensive. So, a bunch of smart little entrepreneurs or whatever uh, decided that they could get rich by smuggling in Dutch tea, because that wouldn't have the tax on it. One of those tea smugglers was Sam Adams, pictured here leading the Boston Tea Party. And even if he didn't take part in it, he was like super pro Tea Party. Another smuggler you may have heard of was John Hancock, who took up all of the signing room on the Declaration of Independence. So Parliament got rid of the tea tax in Britain, then they added a new one in the colonies, but then the tea got so expensive that people weren't buying it, they were buying the smuggled tea. So then what they did was the East India Company cut out the middlemen in England and just sent the tea straight to the colonies, but it was still taxed. But it ended up being cheaper than the smuggler's tea because it didn't go through all of these channels. So the tea that they were getting was cheaper, but these smugglers were obviously upset that it was encroaching on their business, so they riled people up by saying, hey, we didn't have a say in this taxation. Kill a couple birds with one stone, you know, because they probably were upset that they didn't have a say in their government, but really it was about their business. These motivations are definitely not above criticism. So Sarah just happens to be on the ship with all the tea, which is weird because I thought the whole point was that the tea didn't stop in England, but okay. Anyway, it's bad news for her because this was before white male Bostonians had the socks and the pats as outlets for their toxic masculinity, so they're just gonna like destroy this ship. Moses Loki calls out the Tea Party's cultural appropriation. A mohawk with yellow hair? And then James was like, sick. BuzzFeed is totally gonna buy this story. We're just after the tea! Twitter watching beauty gurus on YouTube. Okay, so James wants to get the story. So he goes below deck, even though clearly everything is happening above deck because that's where the tea and the water you throw the tea into are. So like, if you wanted the story, you should just stay there. But anyway, he runs into Sarah. She hits him because she thinks he's gonna hurt her and... Disgraceful. The tea is private property. This is so uncivilized. Destroying private property to protest in America? <laughs> and that's how America was founded. Show over, boom, done. <laughs> The army's coming, so they all have to jump out of the ship. But as they escape, Sarah's locket gets taken by a red coat. Oh no! It sinks to the bottom of the Boston Harbor. That's gonna be important later. Kinda. Not really. So they're out past curfew, and like nobody's commenting on how Moses would be the most screwed if they got caught, probably, right? These kids are like, oh, but they saw our faces. But Moses is a black man outside at night, past curfew, in a city overrun by red coats. Check your privilege, kids. Even if you don't like the laws, you can't just ignore them. That will lead to chaos. But what if the law is unjust? This is Antifa propaganda. Oi, propaganda, what? There's so much I could say about this, but I don't want to end up on a watch list somewhere, so. Sarah says she doesn't think that Ben Franklin would approve of the Tea Party, and she's kind of right, uh, cause he was just kind of like, sucks they destroyed your tea, but like maybe they could compensate you for it. Only they destroyed about 46 tons of tea, which today would be worth $1.7 million. Just thrown out of a ship. That's kind of impressive. A cop is on the side of the road and Moses says he's got hogs under the blanket, but like they aren't moving or anything. So like, are they supposed to be dead hogs or something? I don't know, but the cop is just like, whatever, they smell bad, so checks out. But also like, Again, I feel like Moses's race would, it, 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 the interactions would be different, right? Maybe? I don't know. I wasn't there. But like, the Boston Massacre, which had happened just a few years prior, the first person killed was Crispus Attucks, who was half black and half Native American, 
and he's considered the first casualty of the American Revolution, and it was basically police brutality. And he was a member of two racial groups that this country would go on to treat really horribly, and to this day, are very frequently victims of police brutality. Also, like, John Adams. John Adams was probably one of the least racist founding fathers, but oh my god, that bar is so low. But in court, he defended the British soldiers who killed Crispus Attucks and the others at the Boston Massacre. Uh, and his defense got kind of racist, but also just really weird, saying Attucks in particular had undertaken to be the hero of the night and showed mad behavior even though he was unarmed. He also accused the crowd in general like, well, it was a bunch of black and Irish people and saucy boys, which, what? Moses knows of Phyllis Wheatley's poem, so he just stalks her, which is super inappropriate. Okay, so Phyllis Wheatley. Um, she's really kind about her slavers in this show. Mrs. Wheatley helped me learn to read. Not just English, but also Latin and Greek. The Wheatleys have helped me greatly. They even sent me to London. And she kind of downplays, you know, the horrors of being a slave, which scandalizes Sarah. But unfortunately, Phyllis Wheatley in real life had some kind of like Stockholm syndrome -y views about her enslavement. She has this poem called On Being Brought from Africa to America. It's very, well, I'm a Christian now, so I won't go to hell, so my abusive mistreatment and kidnapping is totally fine, which is like really sad. It's really heartbreaking to read, honestly. But as a person who wants to make media, I would then worry about the implications of having a slave character say that on a children's show, uh, be so nonchalant about it, because I feel like that could give off a certain implication. I mean, I know that it really happened in this particular case, and I'm not saying that we should like lie or anything, but what effect does it have on its audience when one of the first slaves who's not a former slave, like who is currently enslaved that we see in the show, is just kind of like, yeah, it's no big. It kind of feels like we're downplaying it a bit. But I don't know. That being said, Sarah's usually pretty cool about being like anti-slavery, pro-women. How can a woman like Phyllis Wheatley be somebody's property? It's outrageous. Am I the only one who sees this? She calls out some of the founding fathers on some of these things in future episodes, which is like cool. It's really cool to see on a children's show though too. On, because we don't usually, like here in America, these figures are basically worshiped. So for the show to even just critique them even so gently, is kind of like, huh, whoa, you know? Okay, so speaking of slavery, uh, we get Moses' backstory, and it, it is a lot more goes into the horrors of slavery. He was kidnapped as a child from Africa and sent over to Virginia, and those journeys were bad. Sorry, I don't have words for how bad it was. Like, they were really bad. It was called the Middle Passage. It was the part of the triangular slave trade where the Africans were forcibly brought to current day US and they were treated so horribly. They were crammed into ships. They were fed only one meal a day. About 15% died on the sea alone. And about two to four million African people died as a result of the slave trade. It, it was horrific. Moses was lucky. He was able to learn smithing and got some compensation. So he was one of the slaves who was able to buy his own freedom. I'm not sure how common this was, but apparently 42% of free black people in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1839 had bought their freedom. The source I got that statistic from also has some really interesting stories from slaves who bought their freedom. And a lot of the time, these people also like bought their family's freedom. So that's in the description if you're interested. Travel to Philadelphia. There, I learned to read and write and was offered a job by Dr. Franklin, a man who hates slavery as much as I. Okay, yeah, let's talk about this. So Ben Franklin once owned a few slaves. And at that time, he was under the then common racist misconception that, uh, black people inherently couldn't be educated. Um, and apparently if you can't be educated, you can be treated like objects. But then he saw some African kids getting educated and he was like, oh, never mind, I guess. Which like, Ben. Ben, you're supposed to be a man of science, like, and yet you didn't think to test or fact check this very testable idea that black people couldn't be educated, but you had time to fly kites in thunderstorms. But you, had, you fly a kite in a thunderstorm, but you won't 
So, oh my God. He was still a very cautious abolitionist and it was like a centrist about it, all both sides. And he mostly argued by saying that slavery doesn't make economic sense. But some people say that that's the only kind of argument a slave owner would listen to because they obviously weren't stopped by the immorality of it. But still, like Ben Franklin wasn't some super cool, hardcore abolitionist. And neither was Alexander Hamilton. I believe America's struggle is like my own. The colonists consider themselves enslaved to a master they did not choose. I can't tell how like bad this is because on the one hand, to compare the oppression of like full on slaves who were owned to people who are just subjects of like a bad government, it feels pretty yikes. Um, but on the other hand, there were people like James Armistead who I really want to cover the episode of. Uh, he's like my favorite who were slaves, who had similar ideals and really believed in like the concept of the revolution. Um, but as we know, at the end of the day, when these white dudes were fighting for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it meant for only them, for like white land-owning dudes. Sarah's calling out the racist hypocrisy and she's like, well, I'm stoked for Ben Franklin to get here and set everything straight, but Ben Franklin is on trial in England for being a traitor. <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of episode one of the two-part pilot, which was something I really liked about this show. Like, it was one of the only, if not the only, really serialized kids' show. And it's also cool because we get to jam out to the theme song again. I'm looking at life through my own eyes. I'm searching for a hero to idolize. Feeling the pain as innocence dies. Sarah's like, that party sucked, mom. There was so much cultural appropriation going on and I low-key got kidnapped and I didn't even get drunk back at Ben Franklin's trial. Your honor, he spilled the tea. Also, I don't think trials look like this. What kind of courtroom setup is this? Is this for real, England? Is this what you do? Perhaps I need to remind you, a rope is the proper reward for treason. Uh, so yeah, this PBS kids show just had a character threaten to execute another. Fun, fun. There's Redcoat staying at the Wheatleys with Sarah and James is so oblivious because that's high comedy when you're eight. The reason they're there, by the way, the soldiers, is because of this thing called quartering, which was where soldiers had a right to just crash your place and make you do stuff for them, I guess. It's why we have that one random amendment that says the troops can't do that, like the third or whatever. James is like, you can't blame me. I'm an orphan and some orphans use disrespect to cope. I am outraged too. This pie was too small. Take a shot every time Henri has a food-related joke, but don't, cause you'll die. We hear Henri's tragic backstory. His parents were indentured servants, but they caught the plague? That plague? Okay. So the captain kidnapped Henri, and he had to pay his parents' passage. So yeah, this show has multiple instances of human trafficking in it, and death threats. No wonder I'm so messed up. Update, apparently Elon Musk wants an adventured servitude on uh, Mars, so don't catch the plague on the SpaceX. James talks about their rescue mission on the way to pick up some, like, ink or whatever. Then I wrote to Dr. Franklin and asked to have Henri work in the print shop to pay for his room and board. Which I think is still child labor and maybe not great. Phyllis Wheatley sends James to a friend's place to go print some stuff, but it's Sunday. Today's the Sabbath. The Lord's Day. And Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday, but... Phyllis gave us a key, so what? why was that ever an issue? <laughs> so they sneak in to quickly print the story, but Moses accidentally starts a Rube Goldberg machine that wakes the Redcoats, and they're like, Oh, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? I'll bet they're the same brats who got away during the tea riot. The dude from the tea party just knows it's gonna be them. We learn James's tragic backstory, and if only his parents had one of Dr. Franklin's newfangled lightning rods, he wouldn't be the kind of kid Batman would adopt. Wait, is Ben Franklin the Batman of this universe? Orphan collecting? Check. Ultra rich? Check. Influencing historical events? Check. Furries? Probably. Yeah, Ben Franklin is Batman. It's terrible, but it's still better than all-star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. The bar is low. Sarah's sad she lost her locket and her and James have a moment. Okay, we're back at Ben Franklin's trial. The prosecutor calls him a traitor again. Like, dude, get on with it. I will casually pepper in that he's the postmaster general. He be stripped of his position as postmaster. Exposition. Ben gives some long speech about how he's actually not British, he's American. And everyone's super scandalized, but Sarah's mom thinks it's hot. Yeah, they're having an affair. The soldiers see Henri and James putting up agitprop, but they do a barrel roll away from the haters. And even though Henri is screaming the entire time, 
they don't get caught. The Redcoats eventually come back to their place, and Phyllis Wheatley says she was just giving them a tour of where she prints her poetry, and she recites it with angelic music in the background. Descend to earth, their place thy throne. And they're like, yeah, no, we're still gonna have to see the posters. <laughs> but like, wouldn't it be smarter to investigate the printing press? Because they admitted to being there, so if you find any propaganda, oi, propaganda, what? Then like, you've got them. <laughs> The soldier appeals to Sarah's patriotism because her dad would want her to be a snitch, but she gets them to give up by being hospitable and she even throws one of the posters in the fire. And James is like, thanks. She's like, okay, you need to go on Queer Eye. And he's like, it'll be fine. I'll turn you into American. By the end of this show, you will only eat cheeseburger. They're back in Philly. Sarah's writing her mom another letter, like cut the cord already. Apparently Ben Franklin is no longer Postmaster General, which did happen but he was in England for a lot of it anyway, and at least he avoided prison or the rope. And grand romantic gesture, they made her her own locket out of James's gold ring. Like, damn, that's really romantic, but also like kind of strong. Like, you just met this girl. Chill out, kid, you're like 14. And that's the show. Was I wrong about anything? Probably, let me know. Yeah, like one of those history teachers who also has a YouTube channel is probably gonna come for me. I look forward to it. But I wanna make another one of these videos on some other episodes of this show because I just think it's fascinating. And it did really shape like my creativity, I guess you could say. This video gets one like, that's two or 11. This video gets one like, I will make a part two. So be sure to smash that like button like it's a crate full of tax British tea. I would like to know what you think of this show. What do you think of my analysis? If you could call it that. I, I'm just fascinated by how this show handles various issues, especially within this episode. Um, leave your medium well takes in the comments below. Also, if you like learning and fun things, uh, you should check out my sister's podcast, Will We Make It Out Alive? Uh, they talk about bees and poop and environmental restoration projects and GIS, and I made some YouTube videos for them, so go watch that and go check out their podcast. Thank you for watching. Huh. <laughs> Most APUSH teachers like stopped around like 1960 or didn't get far enough from what I heard from people who went to other schools. But my teacher was fantastic and very thorough and she covered everything. We even had a whole project about Nixon and his like effectiveness or relationship to the media or something like that. And then the APUSH test day came and there's a section where you have to write an essay and incorporate some documents. And the question for our year was all about Nixon and you could feel in the room, like we couldn't say anything, but if we could, everyone just would have been like, yes. And so I aced it, and I think most of our class did, so that was fun. That's my story.